I want you to look at these faces. All of them are faces of daughters of freed slaves or of girls who are slaves themselves. Picture their faces in your mind as I talk to you today. Hi, I'm Callie Patterson. I'm a freshman at St. Thomas Aquinas High School right here in Dover, New Hampshire. Today, I'm here to tell you that you can make a difference. Today, we as teenagers are told we need to find ourselves when the word teenager is a recent invention. Up until the 1940s, there were children, and then there were adults. This is George. George was in, the, in Northern Virginia in the 1700s. After losing his father, George mastered geometry, trigonometry, and surveying by the time he was 16. By 17, George became the official surveyor of Culpeper County, Virginia. George was a man at 17. This is David. David began a career at sea at age 10 and at 11 saw his first battle. At age 12, David was given command of a captured British ship to take the vessel and its men back to the United States, prevailing over the British captain's threats and objections. At one point, David promptly sent him word that if he stepped foot on deck with his pistols, he'd be shot and thrown overboard. The captain decided to stay below. This is Claire. Claire was born in Massachusetts in 1821, when her older brother David fell from the roof of a barn and was seriously injured when she was 11 years old. She surprised everyone by demonstrating all the qualities of an experienced nurse in the sick room. By age 14, she became the nurse for her father's hired man, and then to more as the epidemic spread. By 17, she became a successful school teacher with over 40 students, some nearly as old as she. All three of these young people were given increasing levels of responsibility at early ages. They not only survived, they rose to the occasion. We don't need to be tall, strong, or old to do something. We just need to be willing. George Washington, Claire Barton, and David Farragut are known today for the things that they did as adults, when in reality, it's the things that they did as teenagers that got them there. I read these three stories in a book called Do Hard Things by Alex and Brett Harris. These stories inspired me to find a job of people to help or make a difference in their lives. In Nepal, I found just that. Last February, I went to Nepal with a local businessman who created a nonprofit organization called True Sojourners to help with freed slaves. When most people think or hear of Nepal, most people think of Kathmandu or Mount Everest. But in reality, it's more than that. It's a small country on the map squeezed in between China and India with colorful dresses and Hindu holy men. It's a place lacking clean water, mud shelters that may not last a season, and clothing that's tattered and torn. There are few cars in western Nepal along the Indian border. Ox-drawn carts are the most common transport. They're a version of our minivans. There's little organized commerce there either. Often the whole family is engaged in the business. These treats they're making here tasted amazing. As amazing as they are, this family still earns less than the global poverty line of $2 a day. In March of 1998, a British article caught the eye of local New Hampshire businessman Mary Nerona. This article soon led to Mr. Nerona's involvement with freeing the slaves and helping their families. After Mr. Nerona freed an initial 42 families, the government outlawed slavery. Not only did he free these families, but he helped buy them land to start their new lives on the right foot. Slavery in Nepal was pronounced illegal only five years ago. However, the problem of slavery has not stopped. One of the forms it takes is through sex trafficking. One to 200,000 Nepalese have been trafficked to India alone. An additional 5,000 Nepali girls are trafficked each year. The estimated age for a young Nepali girl to be trafficked is 12 to 18. These girls are vulnerable due to economic opportunities, <coughs> illiteracy and low education, and socioeconomical and cultural status. They're especially vulnerable because Nepali virgins are falsely believed to cure AIDS. Most victims were lured with promises of better jobs, false marriage proposals, and approaching, daughters to, approaching families to, pay, to sell their daughters to pay off debt. To help with the illiteracy and low education problem, we went to Nepal and worked at two schools and taught English. The two schools we worked at were Prem Nagar School and Grace School. Since my trip to Nepal, a middle school has now been built at both of these two schools, and a third school has been built in further western Nepal in Kichihi. 
My dad and I worked with the third, fourth, and fifth graders at these two schools. The team we went with helped and worked with all the other grades as well. One of the ladies who came with us taught the teachers how to teach English. It's our hope that by teaching them English, especially the young girls, we can give them a valuable skill that will be of value to their families and help reduce the risk of entering the sex trade. How do we teach English? We use the works of Dr. Seuss. We would read a book with them to help them with their phonics. The repetition of these similar sounds helped them a lot with their pronunciation and articulation. I saw much improvement while I was there. Some of the words that they were struggling to say, like fish, they were saying almost perfectly by the time we left. Before I traveled to Nepal, I gathered over 500 Dr. Seuss books for these two schools. The publisher of Dr. Seuss, Random House, gave a very generous donation of books to help with this program. Sometimes we struggled with our English sounds, like F and P, but they worked hard. during the monsoon season. It's very difficult to cross the rivers, even in boats. To help reduce the risk of death, Mary and Rona's team built a zip line across one of the main rivers for the children to use during the monsoon season. Earlier, I showed you a picture of several of these amazing young girls. Now, I want to tell about just one of them. Isa is the first generation of her family born free. Her great-grandparents, grandparents, and parents were all born into slavery. Her family was one of the families that was bought out of slavery. Because of this simple action, Issa was born a free citizen, has the opportunity to go to school, get an education, and get a decent job. The joy in her face is evidence of a life unknown to her parents, a freedom they've only just begun to experience. They now have a place of their own and a land they can farm. You can find Issa by going to the house where the garlic grows, as she told us when we were there. Before I leave, I have a call to action for you. Find a cause. It can be big or small. It can be local or global. Look around your school, church, and community. There are so many people that need help with the simplest things. Build support. Don't be afraid to ask for help, for money, or for volunteers. Don't give up. It won't be easy, but few things worth doing are. Press on, even when frustrated. As for me, I'm hooked. I want to go back. Go back to spend time with Isa and all the other girls. But I'm also seeing troubles in Haiti and all these other countries. So while I'm trying to figure out my next hard thing to do, you should too. Because one person can make a difference. Thank you.